Carlo Staffilani del Dipartimento di Matematica dell'MIT. Eh? Allora, soltanto brevemente un, ricordare che Gigliola ha studiato qui da noi, eh, per gli studenti che lì. sono presenti. Esattamente, era seduta qua. <ride> tanti, poi, tanti, tanti anni fa. Tanti, no, ma non uh, neanche così tanti. Sì, sì. E quindi poi dopo ha deciso di, di partire per gli Stati Uniti, ha preso un PhD a Chicago eh, con Carlo Scheni e poi ha avuto delle posizioni, una estremamente prestigiosa, che è l'Institute for Advanced Study, eh, e lì collaboravi con Burgen, mi ricordo che è stato diciamo, l'inizio di questa sì, direzione sì, di studio, e dopodiché è diventata professoressa a Stanford, e infine adesso è professore, eh, professoressa, all'MIT. No? Non ho cambiato già. <ride> Come no. <ride> Bene, allora il titolo è quello che tutti potete leggere eh? e quindi per noi è un grande onore e siamo felici, Giovanni e io abbiamo appunto avuto questa occasione, l'abbiamo portata eh, realizzata in questo, in questo giorno che è un po' all'estremo sotto l'albero esatto, di Natale. Però, esatto. Allora, intanto ringrazio Giovanna e Alberto per l'invito e faccio il ringraziamento in italiano ma poi parlerò in inglese perché non so parlare matematica in italiano, quindi um, è veramente un grande piacere essere qua, se non mi sentite fatemelo sapere, fate dei segni, è, come dicevo tantissimi anni qua ero uno degli studenti um, a Bologna ed è stata veramente una grande, un trampolino di lancio molto importante. Adesso cambio in inglese. Ok, so um, this is a little story of many problems that people have worked on in dispersive equation. And in particular, as you will see, I will consider the case um, in which the environment or the setup of the equation is uh, on the torus, which in other words really means that I'm considering solutions that are periodic in the space, direct, in the space um, variable. So uh, I like to put these slides first because um, it's a poopourri of different pictures that as for now, for you, should be sort of unrelated. Well, a couple of them, maybe they are more related than others, like here you see waves, water waves. This is a very calm situation. This is a much less calm, so obviously here there is much more nonlinear kind of, kind of phenomenon appearing. This one is a cartoon of a fiber optic. A lot of the solutions of the equations that I will look at um, are used in order to send signals. I'm not a physicist and I'm not an engineer, so I do not know the mechanism, but I know a little bit of mathematics behind it. This is a, a rendering of what we call Perron tree. It's an important uh, construction in harmonic analysis for the Kakeya problem. Here I have some laser waves, I have the rainbow, which I like to use as a um, visual example of uh, the dispersion effect that uh, happens in some, for some of these equations. Down here you have an ellipse, and uh, I outlined um, in darker color the points that are common to the ellipse and to the lat lattice Z2. And uh, I hope that uh, throughout the talk I will, you will see the connection between this and all the other stuff. This is an example of what I, I like to think about dispersion. So if you take a, a, a pebble and you throw it in a body of water in which the boundaries are so far away that you can approximate the space with R2, for example, then you see that the amplitude of the wave as you move farther away from the time zero, it gets smaller and smaller. And that's an effect of uh, dispersion that the amplitude of the waves tend to zero as T goes to infinity as long as there are no boundaries and there are no nonlinear stuff coming into the system. Uh, I said before, this is uh, waves in a um, body of water again. And the last slide is um, a picture of the Bose-Einstein condensation, which is a phenomenon in which uh, that can be described. I will talk a little bit more extensively about that um, by the Schrodinger equation in particular. So uh, I like to give this talk because it really um, shows how many different kinds of mathematics people have been um, using in order to solve some relatively fundamental problems. So clearly harmonic and Fourier analysis is the tool of, uh, of the trade that is used by many mathematicians. 
we chop up things, we look at the small pieces and then we reassemble them, that's really what we do. Um, and then a little bit more surprising is the analytic number theory. Here we are studying waves and it seems strange that analytic number theory comes in and I will give you an example of that. Of course, math physics. I will give you a, an example which dynamical system comes in. That's a little bit more reasonable. We are taking things that change in time. And if I have time, I will talk a little bit about the probability and uh, um, again, something that looks a bit detached from the whole thing, which is a symplectic geometry, just one concept from it. <coughs> so let me start. Um, because I wanted to introduce many different questions and many different ways of approaching the questions, I would like you to think of one particular equation or initial value problem or Cauchy problem, whatever you want to call it, from the very beginning. And I will be using this initial value problem here throughout the whole talk. But you should think that this is not the only one, the only equation that uh, satisfies a lot of this uh, um, uh, question of, for which you can ask a lot of these questions. So let me parse it from the beginning. So this is the typical Schrodinger equation, nonlinear, the nonlinearity is cubic. The i is actually the complex i, otherwise we'll be looking at more elliptic stuff with the right sign. Partial derivative in time, Laplacian, u is the solution and it's a function in time because it's an evolution equation and a space variable x. As I said at the beginning, I like to think about the x in the torus and what that means is that my solution u is going to be periodic in the x variable and the period is going to be different possibly and there is a, a lot of uh, um, things that we have to introduce in order to address the situation in which you have the same period or the ratio being a rational number or let's think about two dimensions, it's much easier to think about that, or two periods which ratio is an irrational number. In fact, the, we know different things about this, this, uh, these two situations and I will describe them more in details. And lambda is, uh, for now, think about a constant, normalize everything, and the sign of this constant, whether plus or minus, it's important because you can see that in the um, conservation law, in particular in the conservation of the Hamiltonian or energy, the lambda appears here. If lambda is positive, you have a positive sign between these two quantities, the kinetic and the potential energy. And of course, since this remains constant, you have automatically a bound for the L2 norm of the gradient and also the L4 norm of the uh, function itself. If instead lambda is negative, then there is a competition between these two quantities and uh, blow up might occur and I'm not going to talk about that. There is another quantity that is conserved, that's the mass, and it's just the L2 norm square of the function u. Now, uh, what you would like to do, and um, would be great to do, is to look at this equation and just say, ask the following. Suppose that your initial data has finite mass and even better, finite energy, so these two quantities are finite. Am I able to find a solution for short time or long time? What can I say about the solution? Now note that if I'm forcing the problem to live in the space in which these quantities are finite, basically you're asking the problem to live in H1. And that's relatively low regularity for the type of analysis that we can do for this, for this kind of problem. But let's talk about that in a little bit. I wanted to first give you a um, recall, I'm sure many of you know of this phenomenon, um, at least uh, one justification for the Schrodinger equation. And uh, that justification that I want to present is related to the so-called um, Bose-Einstein condensation. So the phenomenon is the following. You have either a container or you use some kind of potential to keep um, a gas made of boson uh, localized. The gas is very rarefied, it's not very dense. So if you look at this object, this system, at a temperature not very low, so let's think of temperature which is uh, uh, higher than the absolute zero, then each of these particles are really, they have their own dynamics, they interact very little, and they have all their, um, you know, their, uh, their flow. Now, the phenomenon we wanted to study is what happens as the temperature goes to the absolute zero. As you lower the temperature, a better way of studying this uh, phenomenon is not like uh, um, 
thinking of the um, particles as uh, um, billiard board, balls, but more as little wave packets like you see in the second picture. So this represents the molecule, if you like, of the gas. And as long as the amplitude of these little wave packets is much smaller than the distance between the wave packets, again, there is not much interaction. But as you lower the temperature even further, then there is a critical temperature in which the amplitude of the little waves and the distance between the waves start being comparable, and hence interaction happens. And if you lower even further, then you see this object appearing. It is the giant matter wave, which is really the picture, if you um, think, remember the first slide that I gave was the picture that was on the right um, uh, corner, the bottom corner, the um, Einstein condensation. We would like to study this object mathematically, this limit process. And this is a very hard thing to do because you have to move from uh, um, a dynamics which is now quantistic in a sense to something which is. And uh, how do we uh, capture these two different kinds of setting in mathematics and how do we take this limit? In fact, um, the um, um, the resolution of this problem, at least in three dimension, which is the harder one, was achieved around 2007 by um, Erdoschlein and Yao. So let me uh, transcribe a little bit in mathematics the process of taking this limit and also um, bringing in the Schrodinger equation somehow. So in this um, little cartoon, I'm representing the little wave packets and that mathematically is given by the BBGKY hierarchy. It's an infinite dimension type of big system. And then in this object here, you want to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, here n is the number of particles. Before I was talking about temperature goes to zero, but you can relate the two things. And take this limit, it's not trivial because you have to do quite a lot of combinatorics, and uh, if any of you does uh, um, this kind of mathematics, you know how complicated it can be. But after you take the limit, you end up with what we call gross petaviesky hierarchy, which I'm not writing for you because that's not the purpose of, the, of the today's talk, and it's kind of complicated and long, but in the next slide, I'll give you a little bit more mathematics. Now, um, the limit is already hard per se. It's a hard thing to do. But what it's even harder is to prove that the solution of this gross petaviesky hierarchy is unique. And you really want that for the following reason. So let me give you a little bit more math. Think of the vector xk has component. Each of these component is itself a vector. So if you are in dimension 3, there will be r3 here. And you can think of it to be basically the position of the particle. And let me take, take as the initial data on my gross petaviesky. So the k here represents in which level of the gross petaviesky I'm working. And uh, let me call it gamma 0k. And this initial data is of a particular type. This could be a function of these variables that is not written as a product. But what I'm writing here is this initial data which is written as a product, a product of the function u0 at different coordinate xj, x prime j. OK, so that's my initial data. Now I evolve it. And it's actually relatively simple to see that if I think of the solution to be the product of functions u, where u is the solution of the Schrodinger equation with these guys as initial data, then you can prove by hand that this object gamma k, which is the product of the solution of the Schrodinger equation, is actually a solution of the gross petaviesky You can do the calculation. And now you understand why uniqueness is fundamental. Because if you don't know that given an initial data, like gamma 0 here, you have a unique solution, well, the fact that this is a solution doesn't really tell you enough. But if you know that it's unique, then you know that this is the only way you find the solution. And the relationship between gross petaviesky and Schrodinger equation is precise. OK, so in the little corner there, I just recalled some names. There is a, a lot of literature on this problem. But I just want to say that uh, Spohn was the one that uh, introduced the method and then Erdoschlein and Yao used and they claim that they use also Strickard's estimates. And that was the thing that really interests me at that moment when they did the work in 2007 or so. And so I started looking at this problem. And with uh, Kirkpatrick Schlein, we addressed the question of what happens when 
instead of thinking of this gross petaviesky situation, this limit process and so on in R3, what happens if we are in a periodic setting? And uh, I did some work on that. And there are two teams. One is uh, uh, Thomas Chen and Natasha Pavlovich and Austin. And the other one is Xuan Chen and Homer at uh, Brown that have revised or worked a lot more on this derivation. And uh, um, they, they're still work and they found really interesting stuff recently. OK, so now let me abandon. Um, this is actually how the talk is going to be. I'm going to tell you something, and then when you start being confused, I change into something else. So, <laughs> and that's now the something else, which is related. So a recent year, like a couple of years ago, together with uh, actually a team of women, this is uh, um, Diana Manderson, Natasha Pavlovich, uh, Andrea Nahmod, and myself, we start wondering, um, after we learn about these derivations and the gross petaviesky and the Schrodinger equation, how to are connected, we, we wonder about the following. If you look at the one-dimensional uh, Schrodinger equation, either on the line or on the, on the circle, then you know, and this is very well known and very well studied, that the system is integrable. Now, you can express integrability in many, many different ways. There is a huge amount of work, which is beautiful because it's a, could be viewed algebraic, algebraically, it could be viewed geometrically, um, it can be viewed very analytically, like uh, inverse scattering, like spare. So there is a lot of structure for this equation here. And in particular, the one I want to point your attention to is the fact that if it's integrable, there are infinitely many conservation laws. So in particular, you can prove that besides the L2 norm, which I consider the conservation law at uh, um, level zero, then there is the Hamiltonian, which has the gradient square. But then you can define infinitely many more. And they look all like this. So the first term is the derivative order s, 1 half square and then lower order terms. And you can do that for any s in n. So we were wondering, where does this uh, integrable structure comes from when you do this limit or when you consider it in terms of the gross petaviesky? Nobody had looked at uh, the integrability structure on the infinite dimension gross petaviesky huge system. So we start looking at that. And I thought that would be kind of simple because we could relate very simply the solution of the Schrodinger with the solution of gross petaviesky for factorized initial data. But it wasn't that, that easy because uh, functions become functionals and no. But at the end of the day, we proved that indeed there are infinitely many conservation quantities also for the gross petaviesky. And we are now working in um, other kind of Mm, realization somehow of this uh, integrability. We are looking more on the geometric side of this structure. And uh, um, so that's what we are doing at the moment. OK, so now let's go back to the problem, the Cauchy problem. And I rewrote it here for your convenience. I'm taking the same equation. And like I said, it would be great if you could solve this just assuming that the mass and the energy of the initial data is finite. That's very physical. If you remember, the mass is just L2. The energy basically gives us the L2 norm of the gradient. And if you think about the equation, the equation has a Laplacian here. So it's, if you want to do classically, you immediately know that you go outside this uh, regime. So we're going to transform this initial value problem into an integral equation that can be made sense of without having to take two derivatives, for example, without taking the Laplacian. And the way you do that, it's via Duhamel principle. And this tells you that uh, U is solution of this. Um, of actually, if it is solution of this equation, it's certainly solution of this. Going backwards, you need to assume a regularity. But let's concentrate on that. So u is going to be made by a linear evolution. So st of u0 is the linear solution of the Schrodinger equation. Again, for your convenience, I wrote it again down here. So this is the linear part of the Schrodinger equation. And I'm giving you the initial data u0. And then the solution of this guy, which you can write explicitly. I'm going to give you the formula in a moment, is this guy here. But then you have to account for the nonlinear part, obviously. And this is the integral of the same group now applied to the cubic. OK, now, knowing that u is equal to this expression doesn't tell you what u is, because of course the nonlinearity is in terms of u itself. But it is certainly set up in a way that you can use a fixed point theorem. 
So if you think about the right hand side as an operator applied to you, then if you're able to prove that there is a fixed point, then you get immediately the solution and not just that. You get a lot of information in terms of, because this map is gonna be at least Lipschitz, so you're gonna have continuity with respect to the initial data and the uni uniqueness, of course, and all that. So it looks like solving this problem, it's equivalent to finding, or you know, certainly if you think about, it's not equivalent, I don't wanna say that because it depends on the regularity, but certainly can be addressed by a sort of fixed point type theorem. So now if you concentrate on this right hand side here, which is my operator in you, well you say, great, I'm gonna do a fixed point. Let's, for example, think about the contraction mapping. First problem you have is what is the space of functions in which I can even set up such a thing? Well, at the beginning, because as we all do, we re reduce the problem to something a little bit simpler. So for example, we are saying, well, if I'm thinking, for example, for short time, this right hand side, as long as I can make sense of it, it might be just a small perturbation of the linear part. So that's reasonable. And it turns out that if you also think that you have a small data, you, this guy here might be a small perturbation of the previous. This is not so easy, I mean, it makes sense, but you have to really think about very hard in which situation you are. And in fact, I'm not gonna do this, but there is a very <coughs> special scaling here. And it, based on that scaling, you can decide whether if uh, the initial data is in a certain HS norm, if that S is, uh, what we call critical, subcritical, supercritical, then the argument that I gave you is actually um, something that you can do. So if you are in the so-called subcritical case, this is indeed um, a small perturbation. If you are in the critical case, depends if you want to look just at local time or global, and if you are in the supercritical situation, that's not at all the case. Anyway, so we learn now that at least in some good cases, we can think of this right hand side to, to be of two parts in which this is a small perturbation of the first. So we're gonna concentrate just on the linear problem. And it's always a good idea to learn as much as possible about the linear solution. And in particular, in which spaces of functions this linear solution lives. Because once we identify in which space of function it lives, then if we pick at the space correctly, we can prove that this is a perturbation and we can move on. So let me concentrate now on the estimates for the linear problem. I hope I justified enough why we look at it. So these estimates that are in fact presented in order to um, identify the space where we wanna do the fixed point are called Strickart's estimates. They go back to Strickart's and they, uh, at least in RN, they have been the topic of many, many theorems in um, what we call the restriction of the Fourier transform. And I'm not gonna, as you can see here, I'm actually putting myself in the situation the X variable is in the torus. But if the X variable were in Rn, then estimating the linear solution is equivalent in finding good estimates for the restriction of the Fourier transfer on a paraboloid. So the torus is attached to a paraboloid because you have the Laplacian. If you're doing the KDV where you have a cubic, you have a cubic uh, curve. So there are a lot of theorems on that. And th those restrictions are possible because in fact the uh, parabola is something curved. If you were restricting like a, a function which is in L2, Fourier transform um, of a function which is in L2, on a plane, that's not possible, right? Because that would be a measure, of, a set of measure zero, and it's flat, you cannot restrict. But if there is a parabola, you can. So I'm not gonna talk about that because I wanna consider the periodic case here, which is different. So the estimates that you would like to do are the following. I'm taking the linear solution, I'm gonna estimate in some LQ in time and some L, LP in space, but in the torus it happens to be that you are much better situated if these two exponents are the same. In our end, the family is much larger. And here I'm localizing in time, which is something that you don't do if you are in R2, because in R2 there is dispersion due to the lack of boundaries, and you have this, this 
I expressed already the, the dispersion in terms of the amplitude of the wave decaying to zero as t goes to infinity. So you're going to be able to integrate in time. But in the periodic case, that's not possible. There is no dispersion. You hit the boundary. In fact, I will tell you in a moment why there is no dispersion in one example. So you have to localize in time. And you wanted to prove that these uh, LQ estimates are bounded by the initial data in some sub space. You always put here spaces that are based L2 because the conservation of mass and conservation of energy, which are expressed in L2. So let's fix our ideas, and let's just consider one of these particular situations for dimension 2, say, and the, the appropriate exponent to take is Q equals 4. And now I wrote for you the explicit solution. You can do that by taking Fourier transform. Go to the equation, take Fourier transform, becomes an ODE, solve the ODE, and there you are. So in here, uh, this is so attached to the symbol of the Laplacian because you are solving the Schrodinger equation. And it looks like this, OK? This alpha 1 and alpha 2 are positive numbers. And um, the situation becomes different if you assume that the quotient between alpha 1 and alpha 2, which, by the way, are the inverse of the period, modulo 2 pi, whatever. But the point is that uh, if you take this 2 coefficient here, and the ratio is a rational number, we call that rational torus. If instead it's a rational number, we call that irrational torus. Now, you can see just by inspection that if alpha 1 and alpha 2 are, we are in this setup, and up we put a constant in front, you can see anyway that if, uh, let's think of alpha 1 and alpha 2 to be natural number, then this object being e to the i t times a natural number is going to be periodic. So this tells you that when you are in rational tori, your linear solution is periodic in time. So certainly cannot disperse, OK? Because it keeps repeating itself. And that's, you see, how the effect, explicitly how the effect of the boundary really kills the dispersion completely. If you are irrational, that's not true, OK? So not necessarily true. All right, so let's move on. Um, and let me tell you about this particular estimates that Bourguin proved in the 90s, early 90s. So again, I'm in dimension 2. I'm taking the L4. So here's, and think about, for example, the square torus, just to make things simple. But certainly, he took the rational torus okay, in his proof. And because I said that in the, when you have a rational torus, you're also periodic in time, here, instead of the interval 0, 1, we can just put the circle, because we have periodicity. OK, so before him, nobody knew how to, do, how to estimate the L4 norm. This was already known in R2, but in the periodic case, it was not known. And just to compare, if uh, you wanted to do the L4 estimates on the plane, in here, you will get an L2 norm. You will not get the H epsilon for epsilon strictly greater than 0. So you lose a little bit in the periodicity case when there is periodicity, and here you cannot just put the mass, which you can do in R2, but you have to pay with a derivative. And I wanted to show you why you pay with a derivative, and why, in order for going to do this, he actually used analytic number theory. So now, if you think about this expression in R2, this sum here will be replaced by an integral. And you have an oscillation here. So this will be an oscillatory integral, and you can do a bunch of integration by parts in the right way, and you start getting decays, and you move on, and you're good. The reason why people didn't know how to do this is because it's a, uh, an oscillatory sum. An oscillatory sum it does not allow you to do change of variables and integration by parts and things like that. Okay? These are objects that are studied in analytic number theory. But in order to prove these estimates, actually, you, it's not that hard if you can read Bruggen's paper. So, um, you start in the following way. You have an L4 norm. What you do is you replace this L4 norm by the following. You take the product of STU0 with STU0 in L2. That would be the L4 norm squared. Once you have the product of this in L2, you use Plancher L. Then you take the Fourier transform of the product. That becomes the convolution. You do a Holder, Holder or Cauchy-Schwartz um, type of estimates, and you end up by Everything right on the right hand side, but you have to measure this set. You have to count how many lattice points are on this um, basically ellipse. 
So that was the beginning picture that I gave you. So lattice point, how many lattice points are this ellipse? Now this ellipse are not, in the rational case that it was actually considering, it was actually thinking of L1, uh, alpha one and alpha two to be one, but you can think of alpha one and alpha two to be fixed integers. You can actually count that in terms of R. So R is the radius of this, or so the eccentricity, if you look, like of this uh, um, uh, ellipse. And basically the question is, uh, um, in how many different ways can I write a square in terms of sums of two squares in between integers? So that's a pretty, um, it's one of the lemmas that you find at the beginning of analytic number theory book. It's a lemma about Gauss. And so you can do that. The numbers uh, of this, uh, the, the, um, uh, the numbers of integers that satisfies this uh, equation is bound, well, it, this is actually an explicit expression, but it's certainly bounded by r to the epsilon, as long as epsilon is strictly greater than zero. So that's where the epsilon comes from. So in this um, lemma of theorem of Bourguin, analytic number theory is informing harmonic analysis. Of course, um, this work was leaving completely open what happens when instead you have a generic torus, not necessarily this uh, rational torus. And, uh, um, and it's not just that we didn't have a right, uh, uh, um, we couldn't count, just as in this case, the numbers of, uh, the numbers of lattice points on uh, ellipses where this, let's say, alpha one is one and alpha two is square root of two. That's not the only problem, and which is actually there. It's also the fact that uh, in that case, you don't have periodicity in time, so you have to cut off in time. So instead of really a circle, you will get like a, a fuzzy um, annulus. So it was hard. So it took about 20 years for people to uh, fix this issue. And in fact, this is the result of uh, Burgen himself with a younger um, harmonic analyst, Demeter, and they proved exactly the same estimate that I wrote before. Of course, here you don't have any more the circle because you are no longer periodic necessarily, but you had to cut in an interval zero one. And the interesting thing about this result is that there is no number theory at all. It's purely harmonic analysis. In fact, it's not even a direct proof. It's a corollary, relatively simple corollary, corollary of a much bigger theorem, which is called the L2 decoupling theorem, which used to be called L2 decoupling conjecture, and they proved it. And this kind of theorem that they proved, it's very much linked to the type of um, um, questions that come along when you have to work on the Kakea problem, which is connected to the parent tree, which, for which I give you a picture at the beginning. Um, now, I have to say that just Strickert's estimate is not quite enough to prove well poseness and to fix this problem of the uh, fixed point um, argument that you want to use. You have to use the um, improved street cards or the bilinear street cards. So that's some work that I did with my graduate student, Chen Ji Fan, and uh, the, a graduate student of uh, um, Larry Goose and my postdoc, Bobby Wilson. And then even more interesting, according to me actually, is uh, the fact that uh, um, it's true that we can prove now for any torus the Strickart's estimates, but it's also true, thanks to the work of Yudeng, uh, Pierre Germain, and Larry Goose, that if you are in a situation in which your torus is irrational, then the Strickart's estimates are um, available for longer time. And that seems uh, at least something that you could have expected because uh, when you hit the boundary, if you are periodic, you go back to yourself after waiting a little bit. But uh, if you are, sorry, if you are rational, if you are irrational, you keep, um, you have a little bit more space to, to move. And hence, in a way, you have very, very faint type of dispersion, if you like. So it makes sense that you have, you, you have a strict art system for a longer time. But um, even more remarkable is the fact that these arguments that uh, um, Bourguin and Demeter and Goose brought into harmonic analysis to prove the Strickert's estimate of better the L2 decoupling theorem have been now used in order to prove really important theorem in analytic number theory. Like for example, the mean value theorem of Vinogradov, which measures or which counts the solutions of certain Diophantine equation. So now it's going the opposite direction. The harmonic analysis is actually proving theorem in uh, analytic number theory. 
OK, as I promised, we switch gear again a little bit. Um, yes. So for the, the, the decoupling theorem holds also for curves then? Yes, so yes, yes, yes. And not just for the parabola. It's a very general thing, yes. For, for curves, you can set it up. You, you need to have some curvature, yeah. But it's connected with the Diophantine equations. And you can now see, switch back and forth. OK, so now that I have the Strickart's estimates and I can do my fixed point, I'm actually going to do that. And um, you have that you can prove for any lambda actually plus or minus because you're just looking at a very small time. So you are not looking at the, anything that could blow up yet. You have um, what we call a local well poseness, meaning we can prove that there is a solution, there is uniqueness, that is stable and continuous with, with respect to initial data, everything for a small time. So it happens that the small time depends on the size of the initial data, the HS norm of the initial data. And since um, I know that the H1 norm, at least in the defocusing case, is kept bounded thanks to the conservation of the Hamiltonian, and since I know that the time is actually inverse proportional to the H1 norm of the initial data, and then I can iterate because the time will not shrink. That will be when you do to the next steps. It will stay the same so you can cover the whole real line. So as a byproduct of the conservation of the um, energy and uh, the mass, then you can iterate the local result when lambda is equal 1 and prove that you have a global solution. If lambda is minus 1, you might have blow up. I'm not going to address that. Now the question is, um, can I have some information about this global solution? Uh, do I know anything what happens when t goes to infinity? So that's my question. One um, thing that, uh, one particular phenomenon that uh, uh, people are interested on is what we call the migration of the energy from low frequencies to high frequency. At least the, rent, like, the mathematical simple version of this can be uh, given by this cartoon. So suppose that time zero, I have uh, an initial data which in frequency space is very localized and small frequency. So, um, I'll, for example, here I'm drawing the graph of the Fourier coefficient absolute value of its square. So, thinking about that guy, and it's localized in very low frequency. So, the question is, if t goes to infinity, can I think that this bump is going to now go to very large frequency? This might happen, in particular because, um, as I will mention in a moment, there are phenomenal resonancy that could contribute to this uh, movement from low frequency to high frequency. But it's not um, a triviality because um, I will show you in a moment that there are a lot of constraints in this problem. So for example, a simple one to think about is the following. What happens if you integrate this? Well, if you integrate that via Plancherel, that's exactly the mass. So the mass is conserved. But if you integrate this guy, you compute the area of the subgraph. So that tells you that for each time, the area of this subgraph has to be constant. So if there is a movement from low frequency to high frequency, that has to at least maintain the area of the subgraph constant. So that means that you cannot just go and do all sorts of weird things. By the way, this is a concept related to weak turbulence and forward cascade. And forward cascade is exactly this idea that you go from low frequency to high frequency as you move. Even more interesting, if you could prove such a forward cascade, will be understanding in what way there is a forward cascade. Is it such that maybe you go a little bit ahead, and then you go a little bit backwards, and then ahead, but overall you move forward? Or is more like this case in the second picture, without going back or anything? So we are very far from understanding any of that in this context. But we know a little bit about how this happens. Although, again, we don't know enough. Um, so one way that was, again, introduced by Bourguin to understand if there is this movement from low frequency to high frequency is to take the Fourier coefficient and hit it with a certain weight that will amplify this movement. So this weight is here, 1 plus c to the s. And it's not important the order here. The important thing is that there is 1 plus c. So if there is a movement from low frequency to high frequency, eventually this quantity should be bigger than what you started with. So the so-called growth of what is this quantity? Well, this is nothing else than the HS norm square. So at the end of the day, you can 
trying to understand the asymptotic in time of the Sobolev norms. Of course, we know that if I have a H1 here, thanks to the Hamiltonian, it's, I have a uniform bound, so that we know. But what about if we have a different S? So we should pick something S which is greater than one to see anything. So that's why people look at the limit as t goes to infinity of the HS norm for that reason. Now, um, one simple thing that you can do just by using the iterative process that I mentioned before to go from local well poison to global well poison is the following. You know that from, to go from a zero to one, say, in time, you're uh, at time one, your solution in HS norm is a group. It's kind of like twice the initial data. And then when you move again, it grows like two to, two to square and so on. So it's very easy by using iteration to prove that uh, this HS norm cannot be more than an exponential. Okay, cannot go faster than that. But can we do better? Okay, so there are a bunch of results that I will give in a moment, but I wanted to first concentrate a little bit what else could prevent the growth of these Sobolev norms. Well, if we have complete integrability, just like I mentioned in one dimension cubic NLS, then there is no growth of Sobolev norm because you can use all the conservation laws, rearrange them in the right way, and you can prove that each one of them is uniformly bounded. Another situation in which you do not get growth of Sobolev norms is when you have, instead of the periodic setting, just you are, for example, in two dimensions, you are on the plane. And why is that? It's because you have scattering. What that means is that you can find, uh, let's fix HS, you can find a U plus if I'm looking at the T plus, T plus infinity, you can find a e minus, U minus if you're looking at T goes to minus infinity. But let's say you can find a U plus such that your solution minus the linear evolution of that U plus as T goes to infinity in the norm HS goes to zero. So this tells you that your nonlinear solution, if you wait long enough, it's gonna start looking like a linear one, like this guy. Of course, if that's the case, and this actually is proved in the problem that I just mentioned, which is the cubic NLS in dimension two, um, was proved um, to be the case in our two, not too long ago, maybe 2014, by Dodson. So it's a recent result. So now using the scattering, you can see, well, take the HS norm, uh, do a triangle inequality, this guy here, if t goes to infinity, it's small. This guy here remains constant because the Schrodinger group is unitary. So st of u in hs is the same as u in hs. So here we, are, we have the complete bound. So it's a uniform bound. So there is no growth when you are in R2. So the first interesting problem to study will be periodic, two dimension, because it's not integrable. And let's see what happens. Well, let me say up front that uh, there is a lot of stuff to be proven. We have very weak results. The way you want to approach this problem is, uh, well, you can give me bounds from above, saying the growth it cannot be more than a certain time, a function in time. But also from below, you want to show that there is something that grows. And we are very far from anything sharp in both directions. So let me recall what we know. So one thing we know is that, uh, well, um, we have already the exponential bound. That was kind of weak. So let's try to see if we can do better. And in fact, as a result of Burgen and my former student, Soinger, that the HS norm for the problem that I'm looking at, this problem, is cannot be more than t to the two times s minus one plus an epsilon. Note that when s is one, you actually have a uniform bound that this misses by an epsilon for that. And then there is um, a more recent result that actually considers the situation, oh, by the way, this proof here originally was done just for the rational torus, but then thanks to the street cards and bilinear street cards can be uh, upgraded to any torus. And now there is this other fact, which is proved by Germain and Deng, and they consider a torus of dimension three, so it's not quite this problem. Um, but what they prove is that uh, um, the bound, this polynomial bound, actually it's better if you are in an irrational torus. What they call here generic tori, what generic means is that the periods, these three periods satisfy a certain diophantine condition. And they prove that this bound, polynomial bound improves. In fact, it appears this theta p here um, only 
because it is irrational. So this is bound from above. Now let's see what we can say about growth. It, it's even worse because what we can say, there are two main theorems in the context of the problem that I'm just um, uh, looking at. So the first is in collaboration with my colleagues, that is so-called I-team, Koliander, Kiel, Takaoka, and Tao. And what we prove is the following. So give me, fix an S greater than zero. That's order of derivative. You can fix any of the, anything like uh, will work. And now give me a delta, and give me a small delta, and give me a large K. Then I can construct for you a solution that at time zero is, has an HS norm smaller than delta. And if you wait long enough, this large T, which is really long, the, you're, sorry, here I'm missing the next, the two lines of the norm anyway. And you measure the norm HS at that time, then you're bigger than K. The reason why this is a, not a very satisfactory theorem is twofold in a sense. First, we have no idea if after a couple of T you go backwards you decrease again. We don't expect that to happen, but we cannot prove that happens. And the second reason why this is not very satisfactory is because you cannot even prove that there is a logarithmic growth for these things, okay? There is another result of uh, Carl and Fau of a different type. What they prove is the following. They are, uh, take an initial data which excites only these small modes in this uh, ball of radius. This is in the Fourier coefficient side. So only these Fourier coefficients are excited. And then they prove that when this evolves, the evolution of this initial data is such that if you pick any large frequency, you can find a little bit of the solution there at a certain time t k. Okay. Um, again, all these results that are state here are in the rational torus. Both of them are the rational torus. Or if you like, square torus, if you want. So I wanted to um, at least give you an idea of how we prove the first result, because I wanted to um, uh, give you an idea of how dynamical system, for example, come in. So um, the way it works is the following. You take, you, you remember you are constructing something. So you have a freedom in uh, trying to construct this solution. You are not proving something for any solution. So I'm gonna express the solution I'm looking for in this way. So if this um, coefficient here was independent of time, that would be solving just the linear problem. But if you make it depending on time, then that will solve a nonlinear problem as long as, well, satisfies a certain uh, system. This is an infinite dimension system because n goes, n belong to Z2, so. Um, so you take this guy, you plug it into the equation, you do a little gauge transformation using the math, never mind that, and you get this gigantic system in which the omega four here is this interaction. And by the way, if omega four is zero, that's the resonance of four waves. And then you have the gamma n, which is uh, like this, and one minus the two minus equals n. That comes from the fact that you're taking a convolution. And then uh, you realize that this is gigantic and the dynamical system is not gonna help you to do that. So you wanna start making reduction. And um, I spare you all the reductions we made but uh, we reduce to the situation in which we have just resonance um, frequency, so the omega four is equal to zero. We describe, we construct a special set of resonances which uh, um, made of generations where these guys belong. And after we do all this reduction, we end up with what we call a toy model that looks much easier because you only have um, nearest neighborhood interaction. And you might wonder, well, you reduce so much, what does this have to do with what you started with, right? That's always something you gotta ask yourself because you might just have simplified things so much. But we actually prove that they are very close. Solution of this toy model minus the solution of what you're looking for, it's a tiny. Hence, if something here grows, it grows on the top, okay? And then this is how, what we do. Um, you note that because the toy model has also a conservation of mass, that corresponds to the fact that, that the whole dynamics lives on this complex sphere, if you want. The enemy improving that you go from a low frequency, think about tau one going to tau n, so moving from this guy to that guy, the enemies is the fact that there are all these large circles that are actually invariant. So for example, if you start here, then you keep rotating on it. It's not gonna move at all further. So in your dynamical system, you had to prove that instead, 
if you start very close, you just go around, you avoid all the obstacles, and you go to the end. And that's really the motion from low to high. And I'm not going to tell you how you do that, but that's the theorem. You start at time zero very close to tau one, and then you avoid all the obstacles, and you get to here. Now, when we did this theorem, none of us knew much about dynamical systems, so everything was done by hand. We just looked at the ODE and we, we did the calculation to prove that we were avoiding all those traps, if you want. But later on, Guardia and Kalashin and House of Procesi, they went and looked at this in a much more uh, satisfactory way. They gave, for example, um, an estimate of how long you have to wait and many other information that we didn't have in our work. Okay. Um, so I want to mention a couple of things. Um, I stressed before <clears throat> that both construction, I didn't go to the construction of Carl and Fau, but both constructions, both what we did and what Carl and Fau did um, were for rational tori. And uh, in fact, you might wonder, are those constructions also true for the irrational tors? And this is a, <clears throat> a work that I did with my postdoc, Bobby Wilson. And what we proved is that uh, when you have an irrational torus, both construction fails. So you cannot use what we constructed in order to prove that there is this kind of growth that I described in both theorems. So that's the conclusion. So we are not claiming that there is no movement from low frequencies to high frequencies. We are just saying that those mechanisms that, we, that have been used in those two, those two theorems, in order to prove that there is something that could grow, it's not going to work if you are in the irrational case. So in particular, if you want to prove that something grows, really, maybe logarithm or something like that, don't put yourself in an irrational torus, put yourself in a square torus, for example. No, I'm sorry. So but in the irrational torus, they, 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 I mean, geodesics are, are dense. Mm -hmm. So this tells you that you can go to any state, so it's in any function which is on the torus, so maybe, so maybe it's not true that you have Maybe it's not true, yeah. Exactly, maybe it's not true. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, which this thing probably, you know, tells you. So what we proved was that at least you cannot do in the irrational. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, just here I have a slide in which uh, mention a few names of people that have worked on this uh, beautiful works in this uh, topic. If you want to ask me more about that, I can certainly give you more information. Um, now, I want to move a little bit into something I didn't mention so far, which is the following. Another interesting fact about considering the periodic case is this. So you can transform this initial value problem into an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. How do you do that? Simply by, and we kind of give you a little bit of a hint when we were uh, uh, looking for the spatial solution before. So take U, take Fourier transfer that has a real part, the coefficient has a real part, and an imaginary part. And if you do the calculation, you see that if you look at the equation for A, N, B, N, that gives you an infinite because N belongs to the Hamiltonian system, where H is exactly the same Hamiltonian that I wrote before. So then the question is, um, can I prove for this infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system very nice and important theorems that are true in the finite dimension one. So I picked a couple that I wanted to describe. Um, and so let me start with the first, which is the um, um, famous theorem of Gromov, which is uh, the non-squeezing theorem. So this says that if you have a, an evolution, so it's a phi of t, uh, which is an Hamiltonian flow, and you also have a symplectic form on it. I'm not going to go into detail what that means, but if you do that, then um, if you claim that uh, you take a ball of radius little r, and you're able to squeeze it into a cylinder of uh, radius capital R, then that capital R has to be bigger than the little r. That's why I call it capital R. So that's the picture. Now, this is not a trivial theorem at all, and it's in finite dimension. So many people, among which Cookson, try to understand whether this fact is true, for example, in the case of the Schrodinger equation, where you have an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system. So Cookson was able to prove the following. If you have this infinite dimension Hamiltonian system, and your flow is a compact perturbation of the linear one, 
then it's possible to prove that there is no squeezing. But the regular NLS or KDD or wave equation, none of them are examples of compact perturbation of the linear flow. So the question was open. So in fact, if you look at this book, uh, they are kind of made up type of initial value problem that will satisfy this compactness assumption. So then Bourguin um, considered the situation in which you have the periodic um, one dimension cubic defocus NLS in which you have a flow in uh, L2. And L2 is also equipped with a symplectic structure. And so the setup was right in order to, you have a flow, you have a symplectic structure, can you prove no squeezing? And he did prove no squeezing in that case. Basically the way he proved it was, well, let's uh, uh, truncate the frequency in a window of size n, apply the theorem of Gromov there, and then take the limit. This taking the limit is the tricky part, because at some point we were looking at exactly the same question but for the KDV. That KDV, the flow we proved that was uh, um, uh, available was defined in h minus a half. In here there is a symplectic structure, so again we say, okay, we're gonna use Bourguin's argument, we truncate in frequency, just take the limit. Unfortunately, the lemma of taking the limit part that Bourguin was able to prove is actually not true for the KDV. That depends on the fact that Bourguin had a um, cubic, which is a three-wave interaction, and in KDV you have two waves interaction, and somehow, for a reason that I can explain more in detail, but you can write it, I'll leave it all on the paper, um, you cannot take that limit. We still were able to prove the theorem with some kind of like a very convoluted way, going through the Miura transformation and so on, but it's not a satisfactory, well, it's not a nice proof, let's put it that way, but again, the result is true. And then a student of mine a couple of years ago in her thesis, she considered the Klein-Gordon equation, the flow. In this space, you have again a structure. Uh, the interesting part in that case was that the flow, it wasn't de deterministically defined. It was a, a flow that existed almost surely, so there was some kind of probability in there. And she also had some result in the non-squeezing. And in fin finally, um, the cubic defocus NLS in two dimension, but you are in R2, so it's a kind of a strange situation because it's not really an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system in the sense that uh, I mentioned before. This is a result of uh, Kilip, Vizan, and Jean. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to present is uh, about the Gibbs measure. Uh, while the non-squeezing theorem is very hard in the finite dimension as well, the invariance of the Gibbs measure is something trivial in the finite dimension case. So what's the Gibbs measure? Well, here I wrote the uh, Hamiltonian finite dimension. Uh, we know via, um, um, I mean, um, Uville's theorem, if you want, that the volume is invariant whenever you have an Hamiltonian flow. In fact, if you take the volume of A, that's equal to the volume of the flow of A for any time. Now, if instead of the volume measure, you define this new measure here, which is e to the minus the Hamiltonian, then the volume, and this is just a little normalization to make a probability measure, then this is also invariant. Why? Because this piece is invariant thanks to the previous one, thanks to the Newville theorem. And this is invariant because the Hamiltonian stays invariant. So it's trivial that this measure, which I want to call Gibbs measure, um, is invariant. So again, mu of A is equal mu of the flow of A. Now what happens if we consider the infinite dimension Hamiltonian system coming from the Schrodinger equation that I have been working on? Well, there are many issues. Um, so the first one is that if you take the regular cubic NLS, you cannot do anything. So you have to do something called weak ordering. You have to weak order your Hamiltonian, which then gives you also the nonlinearity. So you have to put something here different than just a cubic, and I will explain in a moment what that is, but I still think of it as cubic nonlinearity. And then this will give you the touched um, uh, infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system where H is now the weak order uh, equation, uh, weak order Hamiltonian. And then you want to make sense of this. So this is just the, I put in quotation mark because this makes no sense whatsoever. The reason being that the volume part is infinite. So, you know, you cannot define it that way. But nevertheless, very smart probabilist people, um, for example, Leibniz, Rosen, Spear for the 1D, Glim and Jaffe for the 2D and 3D, they prove that there exists a Gibbs measure. So they can actually define it. 
Now the question is, okay, um, is this Gibbs measure that you can define invariant for the flow? The reason why the question was hard, and I explain it more in the next slides, is because it didn't exist a flow for this guy in the support of the Gibbs measure that was proved. Okay, so that didn't exist. So let me, um, uh, let's see, let me state the theorem that Bourguin proved. So again, you have this, uh, um, I wrote here not in the Fourier space, but in the physical space, but there is the equivalent thing in the infinite dimension Hamiltonian. So what he proves is the following. He proves that there is a set sigma in H minus epsilon and the support of the measure is here, such that the measure of this sigma, and this is mu is the Gibbs measure, okay? Is one, so full measure. And for any data in this set, you just not just have a solution, but you have a global solution. So the, there are two parts of this theorem which are really great. One is to prove that there is a flow in, the, in this space here. Remember that uh, um, via the Schrickert system, you need a plus epsilon here, not minus epsilon. So proving that there is a flow, you have to use probability. And then the amazing thing is that the solution is global. And in fact, he used to go from local to global the invariance of the measure itself. So kind of like a conservation law. So how do you prove that there is a flow at this very low regularity? Uh, well, to fix the idea, this is the typical element in the um, support of this kind of Gibbs measure. So if you ignore the Gn, then the Fourier coefficient will be just one over n. And you can see that that's just in H minus epsilon. There's no other way you are not in either space. And then you put this Gn omega, these are independent random Gaussians. Um, and there is an underlying probability space behind it. So this guy is not in the uh, space for which we can do a fixed theorem. Remember for the street cards you need H plus epsilon. And here we are in H minus epsilon. So somehow the, um, this guy has to be used and in particular it's independent. So let me give you the, uh, this is not how we can, if you read this, Theorem is much harder to see, but I want to give you what's the heart of the matter so you can sift through that and uh, understand the idea. So one thing that you have to estimate is this expression. So let me parse for you. This expression is nothing else than taking three linear solution and measuring it in an L2 norm and use the Planchard L and instead taking the Fourier transform of this, uh, the product of three linear solution use convolution. So the way uh, that works now is if you do that, then these are just the coefficient and they are convolved. The bar is because you write the nonlinearity u, u bar u. This space S where you sum everything, well, has the uh, relationship of the convolution. That's clear. And then has the relationship of the fact that you're looking at linear solution of Schrodinger. That's because you have n squared minus n squared so on. At this, the fact that n1 and n3 cannot be equal in 2 is the byproduct of weak ordering of the Hamiltonian. So trust me for that, but that's what it is. And you want to, in, in the mess of the proof, one thing that you would like to estimate is this. Is this expression in little l2 in n, but also little l2m. m is the Fourier transform of the time. Remember, he does it on the square torus. So you are periodic. So that's why you are estimating in Fourier space and time with a little l2 m, m is a natural number. So if you are naive and you follow his proof for the street cards, which I mentioned before, take Fourier trans, will convolve, then do some Cauchy-Schwartz, then you're gonna end up having to measure a certain set. Remember before we were measuring the, the integers on the ellipse? Now that corresponds to this part here. And that reduced to a loss of derivative, just like the epsilon before. So, you know, you have this expression, you write it down, you do Cauchy-Schwartz, and then you have to count how many lattice points are in there. And that will take you away from the space where you're gonna do the fixed point. You lose derivative, that's really what's going on. But if you think about it, when you did this Cauchy-Schwartz, you completely killed the probabilistic approach. So let's do a little bit something smarter. So I'm gonna write again this expression. I wrote it here just exactly what it is. And then to go from this to that, I'm going to use a large deviation estimates that tells you that the absolute value of this expression here can be estimated by the L2 norm in omega, that's the probability space, as long as I'm not expecting to do this for any omega, 
by an asset which is slightly smaller. And the difference, uh, so the complement of this set, is actually decaying exponentially. Of course, I had to put this delta here, but that's fixed. Okay, now I write down this L2 norm in omega. I write it all down, everything goes up because it's not uh, depending on omega, I'm only left with this. And now remembering that N1 and N3 cannot be equals N2 and all of that stuff, then you use the independence and you end up with this. And now if you compare this guy with the top, we have no loss of derivative anymore. So that's why you can close. So that's what it does and much more, but I wanted to uh, give you at least a little bit of a flavor of how does the probability comes in in this thing. And uh, I'm done. This is the last slide with the open questions uh, that you probably gathered throughout the talk. Um, so the first one is, uh, I would like really to understand the street card estimate not as a corollary of the L2 decoupling, but as a direct proof. That would be really good. And then prove better polynomial bounds than the ones I showed you before. Uh, they are just not satisfactory. Um, understanding better this dynamics of versus rational versus irrational torus and what happens. Um, if you are interested in number theory, there is a lot of work here that now you can translate a lot of the harmonic analysis that's been proved recently into theorems in analytic number theory. Um, and also have a more general proof for this no squeezing theorem. So far it's very much ad hoc. For each problem you do something, it would be good to have something which is more general. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you.